companies, we call, I mean, this is one. We call that the compilers change the world, so. transnational perspective beyond the nation, the nation state. Also, European Alternative is organizing uh, each year a festival called the Trans Europa Festival. And uh, we have this Trans Europa Festival in Porto, in Portugal this year. And next year, the Trans Europa Festival will be in Cluj, Napoca, in Romania. So if you happen to be uh, around November 2023 in Cluj, Napoca, please uh, join us in the Trans Europa Festival. Now, what is a transnational assembly? Well, first of all, know that this is the third transnational assembly that we are organizing. We've gathered before in Palermo, in Sicily, and in Porto, in Portugal, where citizens and residents of Europe came to the, together and came to the conclusions of what they consider to be the main emergency that we have to deal with today. Democratizing political participation. Decolonizing political practices, decarbonizing our lives, and last but not least, co organizing to avoid a climate catastrophe. Now, I do want to give a little uh, trigger warning uh, for today. We're going to talk about climate catastrophe and about people experiencing precarious or even dangerous uh, and life threatening conditions. So, if you feel uncomfortable about that and with those topics, um, please be aware that we're going to touch upon those uh, issues. So you might want to just take a moment uh, at some point for yourself. Also, a disclaimer, there will be some photos and videos taken of the assembly of both people on stage and people in the audience. So if you don't want to care in the photos and videos, please let us know. Alright, so today we will pursue this reflection on how the ways in which our individual lives and needs are fully entangled with one another, and how this also means that the political possibilities to confront the crisis that define our lives are equally entangled, shared, and co determined. During the last days of the non public uh, syndicate summit that you've been uh, attending, for some of you, we have come to understand that my individual life 
is only possible through your collective labor. And your individual lives are only possible thanks to the labor of others. In this way, we all have interests in each other's struggles and even eventually affect us all. We know that we live in times of existential risk for us and for those that we care about, for our movements and for our planet. We live a life made of cyclical crises. Except that the crises are getting closer and closer to each other with time. We know from recent years that dramatic events can be the occasion for dramatic change for our societies. Just think of the financial crisis of 2008 that we are still paying the price of. Think of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we are still living through at this moment. Think of the floodings and the forest fires that are destroying our lands. Think of the words that are multiplying and are getting closer and closer to us each time. Today in this theater, you are not an audience. You are performing your own role in this world. In this crisis life. The responsibility is on you, on all of us. We are the real-life actors and actresses of our very own future today. A future that is all too easy to imagine and much more difficult to be prepared for. But in which we all have a power to influence the future if only we begin to act. So get ready because it is time for action. summer 2023. You look at a news report on your telephone. It tells you where you already know. It's far too hot. It's far too hot. The newscaster tells you to stay indoors if you can. But it's so hot in your house as well as being overcrowded. What about air conditioning? Well, you never could afford it. And anyway, there's an energy crisis energy rationing since last winter. The news report is telling you about the thousands of people at risk of dying. The hospitals are overloaded with patients. Retirement homes are panicking. This is the situation all the way throughout Europe. You've lived through heat waves before, but this is different. The intense humidity combined with the heat is making it very difficult for people to continue their everyday lives. Previously, these kinds of extreme heat events have been seen in Pakistan, in Mexico, in Saudi Arabia, but now they're here in Europe, where you live. The government is still trying to reassure, reassure people that this is only a heat wave like in the other years, but the Chancellor and the ministers are contradicting themselves. The European Commission is monitoring the situation and has said it's very concerned. Some of the national leaders in Europe are calling for the borders to be closed to prevent people fleeing the hottest parts of the countries to the coolest parts. You think back again to the COP climate conference in 2022, where again the global governments did nothing to limit climate warming under 1.5 degrees. Some of the rich people in society saw what was coming, and they ensured that they had their own energy generators and that their houses are cool. You can't afford that. Profiting from disaster is again a reflex of some corporations. Like during COVID-19, there are those calling for the health sector to be privatized. And financial property owners like Venovia are criticizing the government 
for not having paid them to refit the houses that they bought at cheap prices in the last crisis. Whatever happens, you have to work to pay the bills. The far right is starting to call for the prioritization of national citizens in the care sector above migrants or anybody who can be thought of as different. Care workers resist all attempts to discriminate between people who should get care. They work under extreme stress, again, not enough support, equipment or pay, no time for families, so many so far away. Two days ago, the delivery riders across Europe's big cities began to strike. It's too hot to work, but their organization and their anger helps. Their demands are clear. They want pay to deliver emergency food during the nights. Agricultural workers forced to work in the hot sun are refusing to work as well. Food companies are expecting mass crop failure and are urging workers to continue working to save what little yield survives the heat. The workers want to work only in the early morning and they are demanding staff increases. Wildcat strikes are spreading across Europe. Unions are experiencing intense divisions and revolt. Factions from across their ranks and files form around demands to expropriate companies that provide essential services, causing divisions against conservative elements of the unions. There is movement, there is panic, and there is confusion. And the heat doesn't help. Private water companies are being taken over by their employees and climate activists. They plan to distribute the water freely as a common good. Police are siding with the property owners. Tech billionaires have their own solutions. They propose spraying chemicals into the stratosphere to reflect the sunlight and cool us down. Scientists are striking in response. The hyper-complexity of the stratosphere is too much to wager. And the introduction of these chemicals may well permanently gray the skies and further affect food yields and the capacity of forests to survive. You used to enjoy summers. Often your happiest dreams take place in summertime. Theatre workers have occupied the theatres and they're opening them up for public debate and organising about what ought to be the response to the crisis. This is one such theatre. So here we are. Outside of this theatre, Many people are panicking, some people are protesting, many people are organizing to try to use their collective power to influence the current situation and the future. They're doing that both in progressive ways and also in reactionary ways. All of us have some power in our personal lives, in our work, in our relation with others, as workers, as migrants, as carers, as activists, as citizens. How are we going to use it? How should you organize to use your powers as workers? on Instagram recently at the news or maybe someone told you door to door in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So we're here today to take action on the crisis with all the young people here in the room trying to organize as people, as workers, as members of communities. So how this is going to work is that we're actually going to put in the light to see each other. We are going to sit here as people together to try to find responses to the crisis. Before we do this and get into groups to really think this through and how we can organize in this great theater as activists and organizers, we are going to take some time to reflect by ourselves on how this crisis affects us. So listen up for a personal reflection. Is the time to realize that 
we are all here together. That we are all together in this, in this crisis. One more crisis, which once again confronts our lives with unimagined challenges and questions. Some may say we are doomed. Others will say it's time to think positive and relax. I want you to take a deep breath. Breathe in and out. I want you to breathe in again and hold your breath for the next 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Do you know when was the last time in your life when time seemed to stand still? Do you 
know the people sitting right next to you, on the left and on the right, behind you and in front of you? Are these the people you would need by your side in this moment of crisis? fight for these people next to you, even if they are strangers to you. And if yes, how far would you go? How would you feel if I asked you to hold the hands of the people next to you? Do you miss human warmth? Please imagine that we are all bound one to another. Would you share a bottle of water with these people next to you? Or do you often feel disgusted by other humans? How does it make you feel when someone cries in front of you? Are you a person who breathes hope into others? Who brings light into other people's lives? May I ask you to remember these moments in the past? These moments when you realized that the climate crisis is real. That the COVID pandemic is also real. And that the cost of living crisis in last winter was also real. Are you ready to stand up for yourself? May I ask you to open your eyes again? I would really love to know how politically depressed in this crisis we all are. In this moment of crisis, do you fear that you may not be recognized because of your background, your class, your gender, your sexuality, your disability, your beliefs, or your attitudes? Do you fear that you may not be able to protect yourself against physical or psychological violence? Do you fear that you may not be taken seriously by other people or institutions? Or do you fear that you may not bear the responsibility for your life alone? Do you fear that you may not have chosen the right course of study or the wrong profession to survive in this moment of crisis? Do you fear that you may have too much debt on your bank account? Do you fear that you may soon not have an apartment because you can't afford it? Or do you fear that you may depend too much on other people or institutions? Do you fear that you might be ashamed of not being educated enough? feel guilty for not being able to get out of bed and fulfill your obligations despite your best efforts? In this heat wave, would you fear that you may not know how long you will have your job for? 
with the fear that you may not find any more meaning in your life that brings you joy? Or would you fear that you may not have friends to stand by you and encourage you? Or do you fear that you may not trust other people? That wars and even more natural disasters may come that threaten our lives? Or that you may not be allowed to talk about all these concerns because you might not be understood, might be rejected, or might be excluded? Have you ever feared that your money may not last until the end of the month? That you may have not enough ownership and control over the means and the ends of your life? That you may lose people you love in these moments of crisis? How do you fear that all these fears may not go away in the future. Dear workers of the world, dear assembly, in the end, and there's only, there's only three questions. Are we ready to tell someone what we need to have a better life and work? Are we ready to fight in solidarity for each other? And are we ready to enter the stage to act together for our common good? Following this moment of self-reflection, a form of a guided meditation of where we position ourselves individually and in relation to others. I want to share with you, because some of you were not with us this morning, um, when we went um, next to uh, the Amazon warehouse of women, where we gathered as a solidarity action with the Amazon workers who will be on strike next Friday. If you happen to be um, in Bremen, you are more than welcome to come and support uh, the strike of the Amazon workers. Some of the people, so we were there in front of the warehouse and we were giving out uh, leaflets and information papers to the workers about uh, that, that strike for next Friday. And some of the workers were happy to listen and to take the paper and read it and learn more about what can they get as workers of that strike and what can they ask for. Some others definitely had a lot of fear. They didn't want to take the paper, they didn't want to engage with us, and they just made their way through between the parking lot and the warehouse, going to work. Which is, of course, very understandable as well. They're afraid of losing their job, they're afraid of losing their security, and my guess is that they are not afraid about those things for themselves, but more for their families. But that shows us also that even in the moments of fear, if you have the support of the other workers, if you have the support of workers from other sectors, and the support of collective groups that are organizing and have the knowledge and the skills to support you in that. You can demand for what you deserve, for what you deserve to get, and for what should be actually the bare minimum. I'm sure a lot of you have had memories, hopes, 
that came in your minds through this self-guided meditation. And I want you now, coming from those memories, focus on how do you want to act upon that. How do you want to transform your fears, your worries, into concrete actions for yourself, but also for the people you love? We're now going to have our first group discussion to act together. And Yana will give you the instructions. Well, um, we have about to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Yana. I'm an organizer and activist, a sugar pronounce. And to be very honest, um, I feel like that reflection thing in this room felt like that crazy, heavy, dark cloud that hangs around me every day. And I, I felt like my body was shrinking sitting there, to be, to be very honest, like on a very personal level. And I really feel like being. Yeah, being here of here these days, I think, gives me a lot of hope, and I think is what makes me feel crazy empowered to do, keep on struggling every day, and that's what we as a group in this uh, theater are going to do now together. So we are going to get in small groups to try to think about ways, in the very first stage, how this imaginary crisis is affecting us as people, so us as sisters, us as siblings, us as friends, us as lovers, it's really thinking about how this affects us. And we have some paper and some pens, we really want to get into an assembly mode and in small groups of six people, that's why I gave you a colorful sticker in the beginning, to think about this for 25 minutes. And then we have two other rounds, we do the same thing as workers, and us as community members, to try to think of us as part of these networks that we are part of as people. Yeah, so basically giving it up to this group, and we are able to actually spread in the room, so if you'd like to sit on the stage or somewhere else, the groups could sit anywhere. I'm really keen to hear from you what, you, what your responses are to this scenario. Right, so this is going to be interactive. So you do have a sticker uh, somewhere on your hand or your t-shirt. Uh, and the sticker has a color and size. So you would find the group of the color and the size and find some word in the space. And I'll spread out some papers and some pens. And then we can assemble and get this going. All right. Like how to organize? Like a phone. Maybe we have phone. Which my, my color? Color? Okay. 
how forms are organizing for internet. So you can turn back to that. The phone I have my roommates. And everybody would have to call like 500 people. So you have to call. Maybe you used it. Sollen wir erstmal ins Plenum und setzen oder wieder die gleichen Gruppen sehen? Ah, nee. Okay. Erst auf die, doch erst auf die Gruppen information and awareness campaign on the severe exploitation systems in Italy, especially in, uh, in agriculture and especially in tomato fields, so southeast of Italy, Napoglia. On Agromafia currently I am um, collaborating with Ilan Sagne, which is the founder of Mercap, which is a campaign and um, a reality that brings in the market the products that comes, that are labor free that comes from uh, situations in which workers and uh, earth is uh, protected and respected. Sono qui dopo due anni per uh, aiutare i braccianti di Campo Bella di Mazzara. Qualche giorno fa il vento è andato a fuoco, l'ennesimo rogo a Campo Bello. Il problema di Campo Bello è un problema nazionale, non è un caso isolato. Lo sfruttamento e il caporalato colpiscono tantissimi braccianti. Stasera c'è un'assemblea per unire la forza lavoro, per capire ai braccianti che insieme ce la possiamo fare. Noi chiediamo alle istituzioni regionali di disporre per i braccianti degli alloggi, perché non si può continuare a vivere la schifezza di Campo Bello di Massara. Dove c'è mancanza di rispetto, dove c'è mancanza di diritti, dove è sfruttamento e quindi parliamo di questi ragazzi. Sono i ragazzi che fanno il lavoro nei miei futuri, i ragazzi che fanno un lavoro così duro, ma sono anche i ragazzi che sfruttano, che fanno il lavoro ma senza avere contratti, che vivono una invece di nulla, senza luce, senza acqua, senza acqua. Da una settimana fa è stato un incendio lì nel ghetto dove è morto anche uno dei ragazzi. Hanno perso centinaia di documenti, loro soldi, anche loro negozi, anche le loro macchine. La notizia è già ovunque, ma in posto c'è tanto, tanto da fare, ma c'è poco fatto. Quindi noi cerchiamo di portare questa cosa in campo per le cose, per il Mediterraneo, a raccontare chi sono questi lavoratori, anche le condizioni che lavorano, vivono lì, e anche le loro proposte che vogliono. Allora, il tema del caporalato purtroppo riguarda tutto il paese e colpisce circa 500.000 braccianti e in Sicilia in particolare la situazione è molto più drammatica nella parte orientale, nella zona del Ragusano e del Siracusano, dove abbiamo lì circa 40.000 lavoratori che vivono e lavorano in condizioni disastrose. Per cui noi chiediamo che la regione Sicilia, che è indietro rispetto alle altre regioni, predisponga già i fondi che hanno a disposizione nella lotta al caporalato. Quindi più controlli nei luoghi di lavoro, più case per i lavoratori che vivono degli insediamenti informali, un sistema di trasporto adeguato per portare in modo sicuro i lavoratori nei luoghi di lavoro e dall'altra parte bisogna creare un sistema agricolo, una filiera etica in modo che il consumatore che compra quei prodotti siciliani sappia no, che dietro a quei prodotti c'è una mano d'opera rispettata. Questa branca qui dietro, quando lo facevamo, c'era giù una lista che aveva un martello, un cuore a fare la solidarietà, che magari la vita non ha mai fatto un bracco. C'è un avvocato che non ha mai toccato, ma insieme abbiamo fatto questo bracco. Quindi io ho visto che l'arte può riempire il buco che manca sulla lotta. Siamo attivisti, ma dentro attivisti chi siamo? Giornalisti, 
avvocati, lavoratori di agricoltura, ristoranti, siamo noi attivisti che lottiamo per i diritti umani. Quindi siamo diversi tra me e la vita, ma sulla lotta siamo tutti compagni. In the 1960s, after World War II, after this huge trauma, Germany needed to be reconstructed. However, there were not enough German workers or German people willing to reconstruct Germany. That's why Germany decided to invite workers from different countries. Germany called these workers guest workers. However, the way these workers were treated can make us question what is hospitality. These workers were getting less than their German colleagues. They were working, working and working. Their children had to raise themselves on the streets because they had no parents at home. Years later, in 1973, they wanted to resist the exploitation and they started white cat strikes. These strikes lasted for six days. They were ended by police force and the strikers were beaten. Almost 50 years later, in 2021, during another trauma during the pandemic, in Germany, people stayed at home. They worked at home, but they needed to be served. They needed someone to serve them the groceries in 10 minutes. I don't know why it's so urgent. And <laughs> migrant workers were the one serving them. They didn't have enough equipment. Their bikes were mostly broken. And at the end of the month, they didn't even get paid. Months later, this time it's different, not years, but months later, they started wildcat strikes. At the end of the strikes, these people managed to get some of their demands met. And people said thank you to them, congratulations, but nothing more. Two years later, in 2023, there is another trauma. The heat wave, the extreme heat wave, it hit Germany as well. Again, people stay at home. They don't want to go out. They work at home. They don't want to risk their lives. The trees behind me, they die. But again, they need to be served. So he's, who is going to serve them? I suppose you know the answer. Yes, migrant workers. But it is okay. You know, they can risk their lives. Most of them are not even civilized. So let them die, right? But no, this time it is different. This time it didn't take them years or months. This time, it took them only a few days to start wildcat strikes. And I believe at the end of this strike, they will get more than congratulations. Because they know what happened 50 years ago. They know what happened two years ago. They know what happened last year because we talk about it. And we are going to talk about it. We don't forget. We won't forget. Thank you. Climate change, we know how it feels. There was a day I started at the company and it was summer. It's getting warmer, warmer and warmer. 
It was a logistic company, but in a normal fulfillment center. They started out in normal buildings where you just store goods and take them out. We had to pick, we had to store, we had to pack. The people start to complain. Hey, it's getting warm. We have an over 40 degrees in the building. What can we do? We are suffering. We're passing out. We need ambulances. Can we at least get some water? Can we adjust the working shift times? The company said no. We have to fulfill the demand from the customer. So it was carrying on and on and on. And then the people talked. They're learning. They were talking. And there was a guy who said, okay, let's start. We do a kickoff. And that was a kickoff to organize. And the movement got more and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the company also got bigger, bigger, and bigger. Where are we now? Okay, we have the corona crisis. The company got huge. They couldn't pick up with the pace. So they hired everybody they could. The people were coming, were leaving, and the old ones, they worked themselves to death. They're almost broken, <coughs> having heavy, healthy issues. But we, we will survive and we will stand and we will fight. You know, when we went there this morning, I always have one song in my mind, you know, like from Bob Marley, stand up and fight for your rights. And that's exactly what we will do. And eventually we will make the company pay. speeches. Uh, now it's your turn, it's our turn in the audience to think about us as workers. What are you working as? Are you working as a writer? Do you maybe work at the university? Are you an artist? Are you a precarious worker working as a freelancer? So we'd like you now to get back into the groups, the same groups you had before, and talk about how would you and this scenario organize as workers. So how can you use your, by withdrawing your labor power, your power to actually make change? Is that through a strike? Is that through other layers of power you have as a worker? So we really would like you to sit together to talk about what kind of workers are you and how can you as workers use your power to create change? All right, let's get back on the groups then.
and then in the prices, it's not, it's not the real spice because we don't... Uh, <laughs> weapons maker. So at the moment, I'm uh, at the Thank university. You. But uh, my worker also has a tour guide. Yeah. I'm traveling a lot. The software just been exported to India. This is a reaction. Vietnam. Cheap labor. Just like that. Especially for vintages. Because also, even if it's because of the problems that the wars and other wars are Welcome back, everyone. I'm glad to see that most of you are still here. So I'm sure you've had very fruitful and uh, inspiring discussions um, together. How can you connect your powers, your influences together to make change collective? and sustainable. Um, you've done the hardest part, congratulations. Uh, and now we can move on to our uh, even more inspiring speeches by the people you will see on stage. So it will go uh, this way. We will have two speeches, then an open mic, where you can take the mic um, if you want to express uh, something specific. Um, you can also, if you want, pinpoint something that was particularly uh, impressive for you in the discussions that you had just before. And then we will have our two last speakers. I'm very happy to welcome on the stage Sima Sieda. In the, final, in the final point, 
is that in our communities and on our streets, we need someone who's going to create a communications hub. Anyone can do it. And we're going to have lists of everybody who lives on our streets. And we're going to check in on them regularly. And we're going to find out what everyone needs. We have basements and we have cellars and we have universities with huge basement areas and ground floors that are cool. And we can make sure that we occupy, take over these spaces and put the people who need to be there, there. And we can save and transform our society. Now on, there's no more profit motive. There is just us, the people, and we work together and transform society based on solidarity, not on capitalism. Dear comrades, friends, colleagues, and companions, this ecological breakdown we're seeing unfold in front of us is only a reflection of our fundamental alienation with nature, of our incapacity to relate and to acknowledge our interdependence with the planet that we're living in, with the territories that make it, with the communities that inhabit it, and ultimately with one another. The times that we're living in have a sense of urgency, indeed. But let's not let this sense of urgency startle us, nor confuse us. We've heard it already. Healthcare workers are overwhelmed, but they are not discriminated between those who should receive care, and neither should we. And so I think the most important question we need to be asking ourselves as we face this crisis is how do we make sure that we're, that we're all cared for? How do we make sure that our comrades can strive for safe and fair working conditions? How do we make sure that we support those whose lives are different from ours, but whose work provides our food and water and make our, makes our spaces livable? And how do we make sure that our many differences do not divide us at a time when we need each other the most? Let's make no mistake. Answering these questions will take time and work. Because it demands us to do something our capitalist society has never taught us to do well, which is to care for each other. Which ultimately means understanding, instead of assuming, what our needs are. Yes, these times are urgent. The crisis is here and it's calling us to act, and so we have to act. But let's not let this sense of urgency startle us, nor confuse us. And overall, let's not, let's not mistake quickness for effectiveness. Because it is this very obsession with productivity, growth, progress, and endless convenience at the expense of harm done elsewhere, what drove us to this cliff where we're standing, set so far apart from the slow and careful rhythms of the very nature that sustains us. Caring for each other is no different than what nature does and it demands us to realize about what is needed to do it right. And we don't need to look too far to see where we're falling short. Our comrade already said it so clearly before, a couple of days ago. Purely performative care is not good enough. We need to come together, talk, listen, or really listen, and learn to relate to each other and to our struggles for as long as it takes so we can learn what is it that we actually need, so we can actually do something about it. Our capacities to care for each other, as another comrade put it, come off the back of the struggle of others. And this is powerful, because it reveals the strength that lies in our differences. Because it is the fact that we need different things that gives us the capacity to do different things for each other. This is what can make us strong and resilient, and what can help us weave together the fabric of our solidarity. So as we're here together, I want to ask you to keep this in mind as we try to break the uncaring, the uncaring patterns that got us into this mess. Thank you.
Thank you very much to uh, the speakers, Sima uh, and Camilo. Uh, and now I want to open the opportunity for you uh, to speak up if you wish to do so. You can just raise your hand and we will circulate uh, this microphone or another microphone. We will find a microphone. Uh, so yes, feel free um, and it's uh, your opportunity to, to speak up. why we need to like keep this word and this consciousness in our mind. Um, one of them is that jobs have, because of late capitalism, jobs and the nature of work has kind of obscured our understanding of class. So for example, um, people might, two people might have the same job but come from a really different class background. So it's not always a good proxy for like the actual resources that someone has. Um, and especially with precarious work, we're finding a lot of mixture, and so we don't necessarily have as much homogenous job forces. And when we're organizing these communities, we really need to be effective organizers by understanding who we're talking to. Um, so this is a really important aspect of it. And then another thing is, I think this weekend is a really amazing and kind of rare space that I don't think I would have ever expected to find myself in, um, especially not when I was in the US. And so I think, how do we increase like the inclusion of people who come from a lower working class background into spaces like this? Um, because it's for me, it's really amazing. And um, yeah, and so I think it's really important. So I think one point is like, I'm always like, I want to represent my people in the community I came from, um, which is why I'm bringing it up here. And but I think it's not to divide on classes, it's actually to say that like we should have solidarity between people no matter what their background is because we can work, we need more people and we need to work better together. But it's really, really important that we are able to include people who are coming from really uh, disadvantaged, uh, like economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So, uh, thank you. For me, that was the biggest uh, uh, change because I, I mean, I guess um, I, I come from another country and I had my activist community there and I moved to Germany and I somehow had a hard time to find a community here. But then I had different um, identities here and then I started slowly to build it, but then the pandemic happened and then I somehow felt always connected with people online. and. I think it has a power, but even in the first practice we did in this discussion group when we had this dystopic future where we might not have internet, um, it's, it's really good to reflect the power of being with people in the same room. And um, uh, I, I really appreciate this and I will seek places for creating such an interaction again because I think this is uh, really different than um, tweeting. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you for this chance very much. Okay, 
is joining on this side, I'd like to say something. It doesn't have to be a full speech, it's really also some thoughts you have, maybe something you discussed and you wrote on your poster. Hello. Uh, I'm Zilia. Uh, as I maybe have some of you know that I moved here 10 months ago and I just started working as a writer. Um, such an immigrant's uh, way to survive in Germany these days. And since I moved here, I have lots of uh, like conflicts in me about my own identity and I try to understand my own position and my own struggle here because we were dealing with some lots of other issues in Turkey. We have uh, some different kind of censorship, uh, huge fascism against especially like Kurdish minority, not minority, Kurdish people uh, and other minorities in Turkey. So when I came here, I was trying to find those people, but I found myself in, in, in a working class struggle as always. Again, and I was in the people while I was um, doing work for immigrant workers. I was always questioning myself why I'm friends with these uh, more privileged people than me. Because and I was also thinking that okay, we need their resources. They need to share their resources with us because we, ne we never had those resources. Like I just had a computer after two years, you know, like. Um, and these events makes me feel much more comfortable than. The other events maybe I attend in Germany because I still I saw much more like people of color here, my own people too. And sometimes okay, class struggle is very important, but for me it doesn't mean anything at the end if you still don't know our culture, our struggle, because we know Western struggles, Western cultures. We are learning how to organize from like American American context context and German context and. I'm just keep asking to myself, how can I adapt these things to some other countries? Because other countries are already like uh, unprivileged. Like we are coming from a very different background, and as much as I see, people don't know our culture. So uh, not just class struggle. Uh, people of color need to be. Uh, I think some people need to step back uh, in these kind of environments and give the stages and spaces to so people of color to express themselves more because then we can feel maybe more equal and uh, we can uh, really feel like, okay, this is co-learning, they are also learning from us because I all, I know people I have good intentions and everything and but still I feel sometimes like uh, feeling like educated, they try to civilize me, you know, and this hurts me. But here I feel more strong. I feel stronger because, as I said, there are much, much more people from Middle East, and I think we need more language facilitators also in this kind of environments. And because these countries are unprivileged, as a, as a whole country, not just personal stories, you know. And yeah, that's the thing. And thank you. quite a while um, with Works Council activism for employees and um, you know for the working class and I'm always surprised how many union busting is going on and um, I'm always asking the question okay how could that be um, what's the purpose behind all of that you know and for me I came to the conclusion it's about the capitalism they're afraid of us Okay, because they know that we are getting more, that we're getting stronger, and that we are coming for them to beat their ass. Thank you, Anna, for this uh, closing words. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for all your contributions um, to, to this uh, call to action uh, moment. Um, and I suggest we feel uh, the energy coming in more and more with our two last speakers that I will welcome right now on stage. Uh, and so I welcome Jonathan on the stage.
let's talk about the forbidden fruit. Many of you would recognize this device. It's an iPhone. This physical device has visited far more, many more countries than I personally have, 43 to be exact. It has exchanged many more hands than I have. In fact, the only hand that I would recognize is the hand of the retail specialist at an Apple store in Berlin by a person named Annika. Bit by bit, Apple has transformed into the three trillion euro corporation that we know today. I am responsible for this, you are responsible for this, all of us are responsible for this, and together we must undo the original sin. As a tech worker, I'm told many things. I'm told I can change the world, that I can change everything. That is except my own workplace. So what is even my own workplace? Is it the bedroom in California where we design these iPhones? Is it the 500 Apple retail stores around the world? Is it the Foxconn factories in China, in Brazil, in India, where these devices are hand assembled by mostly school interns? Is it where the minerals are extracted from around the world in 40 different countries? Can you even call the Congolese children who extract a co cobalt by hand, can you even call them workers? For 50 years, in the wealthiest country in the world, workers, not for the lack of trying or the lack of want, they were not able to organize their workplaces at Apple. But this year, three different Apple stores have unionized and dozens more are to follow. This is really exciting and really impressive, but what about the Foxconn workers that are today on strike in Chennai in India, in Chundaya in Brazil, in Shenzhen in China? Are they not Apple workers too? talk about the iPhone without iTunes, does that even make sense? Our time is running out. Tech companies are only growing bigger and bigger, faster and faster, and they're operating in a very global fashion. Meanwhile, here in this room, the trade unions are operating on a national level. It's time we think different, and it's time we participate in the new global initiative, Apple Together. Thank you. So I wanted to talk about what to do before the end today and whatever we imagine the end to be. And to do that, I wanted to propose you the image of a flower. The first kind of flower that came to my mind is a lotus flower, but that has too much of an association with virginity and bothers me. So I want to ask you to, um, to think of another one. Whatever comes to your mind is perfect. I want you to ask you to close your eyes, if you can, and give the flower to me. And before you open your eyes, I ask you to imagine the environment around the flower. Where are you picking it from? Did the flower resist you? Are there others around it? Now come on, give it to me. And you can keep your eyes closed, or you can have them open, as you prefer. In the simple gesture from your hand, I believe you haven't simply given me a flower, but you have given me your entire human experience, or rather, the synthesis of everything you have lived, read, thought, and felt till now. In a millisecond, all of this is condensed into the flower you imagined. You gave me your aesthetics, your imagination, your taste and your touch. 
Perhaps you gave me a flower that someone gave you. But did you not but you did not give me only your personal synthesis of your human experiences. No, because you're not the only eyes in this world. You gave me all the human experiences on which yours necessarily depends on. And so substantially, this gesture, this gift, carries with it a complex and rich web of living, an internal structure, enormous and bulky, under that simple flower. Experiences which are now, perhaps forgotten, leave in that imagined flower. So here you are, giving me all that you are, and above all, that you have been given. All that you have been given. And don't misunderstand me, of course, not all those things are positive experiences. You give me, also, and above all, I hope, the synthesis of your traumas and sufferings. You are telling me, in your unique way, how you constructed meanings and how you resisted. Specifically, and this is essential, you give me all that you received as relevant. All this meaning of life, however it, uh, however it came about, none of it came only from you. It is a rain of infinite historical ancient flowers falling down flowers of which the seeds have perhaps been lost to the wind. A very sweet and slow downpour of flowers bearing the experiential synthesis of all human history. Not only the lonely white Western history, but also, and above all, the untold stories and histories, the marginal and unconscious, the familiar and insignificant, the ones you observe in others while waiting for a bus distracted and hungry. This human history, this synthesis of human experience, you are giving it to me through your eyes. So you see in this gesture, not by accident I see a water flower because of the movement, movement that comes with it. In this gesture is the entire world, all mixed up and caught up with itself, like a structure of purgatory with its ups and downs. And out of it, it comes your will, your will to give something to another being, a sign of contact with the world, an urgency to give something. In other words, they create, to create an inheritance around an imagined flower. When we donate something, we are donating meaning, the urgency to give and receive. We are donating our collective experiences to other people. We have been doing a lot of this, this past days, I think, no? We are donating our collective experiences to other people, and in doing that, we might save them because there, is, there might be something in our personal experience that resonates with people around us and has a profound meaning to them, even if we ourselves forgot it. We are all fighters here, and we all found meaning in something, and that's how we survived. So what to do before the end? This was the question that we had to answer today together here. What to do before our societies collapse? We have to resist, that is obvious. We have to be sent, not oil, in the gears of this world, this capitalism of death. We have to fight against the 1% who made the, the planet uninhabitable. Yes, we have to fight to protect our communities, the people we love. And to do so, I think we have to return to the place where we picked the flowers. I myself will return to the water of the pond where, in a millisecond, I picked the lotus flower, like some sort of watery nymph, because there, in the choice about what to pick and leave to the world, in the choice, not in the gift itself, there lies the meaning, my meaning, of being in the world. There resides the will to resist, in the gesture before the gift, in the moment when one says to oneself, maybe I have something to give to another, maybe this urgency I feel is not just mine, maybe this hurts you too, and maybe together it hurts us less. Come here, come, come to me if you want. There is space in these waters for each and every one of us. Thank you.
I, I want to share with you the name of the flower that I had in mind, but I don't know how to translate it. Yeah, you are. Uh, it's, uh, I can describe it. It's quite big, it's quite fluffy, and uh, it starts as pink and ends at, as white. I'm not sure it's a good indication, but yeah, you, you can throw your, your guesses. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, of, because of all of what we have experienced today, together, and felt, um, I, I am overwhelmed, of course, as I'm probably not the only one. And, well, we wanted to make sure that we were closing our transnational assembly on workers' solidarity with someone who can um, put the right words on what we've experienced together today. So I welcome my colleague Daniel to the stage for that. Uh, comrades, compañeros y compañeras, companions on this road, of what is a union? It is made of worn out hands, of tired feet, of burning eyes, of draining minds, of injured backs, of worried brows, of sweat-stained clothes, of countless headaches, of tissues filled with tears, of sleepless nights, of unwell stomachs, of grinding teeth, of endless sickness, of haunting sorrows, of countless hopes, of dreams deferred, and yet of boundless loves. Bound together, and bound as one, against asymmetry and against the odds. What is a union but the ever unfolding potential of all this together thrown like a volley of rock against a shared Moloch named Prophet who stands hungry with our children in his hands between us and what we need. What catastrophes and what calamities await us is still an open question. Possibility is not molded beforehand but shaped by the multitude of hands that actively make it. What we wager is our hands and our love to help it grow. What we wager is the power of union, and our weapon is the withdrawal of the very labors that dig our graves in the name of prophets. It was the youth that did it first, after all. It was our mistake to merely applaud their strike as Moloch still consumes them. It is our task to now spread the strike and bring profit down for the sake of all of our tomorrows. Join us in becoming the pride of posterity. Spread ecological syndicalism into the gears of every workplace from which a new world may take root so that we can care for ourselves, our loved ones, and the land we depend on without the chains of profit, without the chains profit has placed upon us. Jose Martí once said in regard to his cycle of struggle that now is the time of furnaces and only light should be seen. Echoing Leonard Cohen, into this furnace now I ask you all to venture, you whom I cannot betray. your active participation and your trust for uh, spending your time and energy uh, with us. I want to welcome uh, my other colleague Jörg to join me on the stage uh, to share um, a little message with you. So folks, I'm, I'm really moved by these three, last three hours 
and I can't add anything more what all the others have said. I just want to paraphrase a dilemma that we have to something to give to one another. And all these flowers we have which make us give us the meaning and the hope and the power to sustain the struggles we are all in together. And I just want to say that there is plenty of workers across this continent who face and across this globe who face massive repression. Massive repression as collectives but also massive repression as individuals. We know Lina, who faces a lot of court cases. We know people like Sheikh, who you have seen in the video, who also faced and who was even in prison. Um, there is other people um, in Berlin who are being fired. And I want us, you know, in this name of what Diletta said to us, and I know that we are all not rich here, but I want us to give us a symbol, these two donation cans, which will be distributed among the workers in Sicily, among the Amazon workers here in Niedersachsen, and among the workers in Berlin who are right now setting up a solidarity fund to help each other through this crisis which we live now and the crisis which may come. So feel very much invited to give what you have, but uh, only as much as it's possible for you. Thank you. Um, and you can afterwards um, put the cans in the cafe uh, so that we find them again. <coughs> Thank you. Um, this is uh, the end now, for real. Um, I uh, ask you please uh, to keep in touch with us if it's not already, if you're not already in direct contact. Uh, you can subscribe to our social media channels, to our newsletters. This is the best way to keep in touch with what we do and where we are, because as you can see, also we have a lot of activities in uh, various places. Uh, so this is really the, the best way. I invite you now to continue the conversation in the cafe um, noon. Um, you will find also some uh, collections of posters and so on. And um, again, I thank you really um, for, for your time and your participation in this. I feel very grateful to have been able to meet you and, and talk with you. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>